Major Chris, and I'm standing on a prehistoric archaeological site along the banks of the Illinois River. For thousands of years, humans have occupied its banks, and below my feet is the evidence of that. Today, we're going to be looking at the artifacts made by its inhabitants and trying to replicate them. In particular, we're going to be looking at their pottery. At this site, there's everything that people here need to survive. There's chert for making stone tools, there's mafic rock to make the temper and pottery, there's the clay for the body of the pottery itself, and there's even plants growing along the edge that you could turn into textiles for fabric compressions on the pots. You can imagine, for thousands of years, people were pulling their canoes up on this location, offloading them, and in later periods, like the Langford, where we have most of our pottery that we're gonna to see today, um, people were eating corn in this location, grinding it, and turning it into bread, probably tanning deer hides, and just living life. These are prehistoric chunks of Mafic FCR. They were probably shattered in a campfire here about a thousand years ago. Um, this type of rock was being crushed up and made into temper for the pots of the Langford tradition people. What this is, is they were getting these rocks really hot by their campfire, and then water or just uneven cooling getting on them was what's causing them to crack. Basically, a temper is being added to the pottery in order to increase its mechanical strength or resistance to thermal shock. In this case, it's probably a bit of both. So it's making the pottery stronger in terms of like being able to stand up, and then with resistance to thermal shock, because you have a cooking pot, you heat it up and you cool it down as you're cooking with it. So it can induce a lot of stress into the pot, and by having a mineral in there that can sort of prevent that cracking from that, you can make a much stronger and much more durable pot. This is a piece of pottery, and I am the first person to touch this for the last thousand years. You can see right here, just flipping this over, that there's actually some sort of impressed design on it. And this is uh, probably closer to the rim of the pot, sort of around the collar. Now, if you recall from earlier when I was talking about that mafic grit, you see all these black specks in there. Those are ground up bits of that type of rock that are giving it strength. This is a piece of Langford tradition pottery. It dates sometime around 1200 to 1300 AD. Um, the Langford tradition lived around the entirety of the Illinois River Valley, or like much of the upper Illinois River Valley uh, during that time period, roughly around the same time that Cahokia was at, at its height. This is actually really interesting. You see that right there? That might actually be the fingernail marks of the prehistoric people. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, like that's definitely a fingernail mark. That's someone's thumbprint or, you know, that's someone's impression from 800 years ago. So, I just noticed something this piece of pottery. This rock is very different than the others. The others are very angular, they're all mafic. This is river rounded. And I believe that that's because this clay was gathered right over there at that creek where rocks were sticking to the wet chunks of clay. And sometimes these rocks got accidentally included in the matrix of the pottery itself. Now one thing that's really important since we're actually picking up artifacts is I wanna talk about archeological ethics. It's important that you, as an amateur, do not go out and dig up archaeological sites. You can damage them, you can destroy what's there. When we archaeologists go out, we have specific research questions. For me, one of the important things about why I care about this site, and I've actually worked with other professionals uh, in the Illinois Archaeological Institute, is the site is being damaged by erosion, right? And so when I go out, I'm intentionally working on documenting it, I'm talking with other archaeological experts, and we're doing it in a way that leaves a paper trail. So when people come back and the site's been destroyed by erosion in another 100 years, we can still learn from it. Um, now, you should always consult local laws and 
be aware of who owns property if you are interested in like going to an archaeological site, right? Uh, there's a lot of local laws that govern who owns the past and you should be aware of that. At this site, there was everything people needed to make their stone tools, like this piece of chert I just found. So a lot of the chert at the site is heat treated and there's a ton of sand at the site, which is a good indication that it's being heat treated on site, or at least it's a very good place to heat treat it because sandy soil uh, works well for convecting that heat into the rock and doing so in a way that's nice and even and doesn't create thermal cracking. And this piece of chert, which we just flint napped, is kind of interesting. It's got these crystal vugs here, and then if you see these little blue lines, those are actually veins of chalcedony. One thing that's worth noting at the site is the Langford tradition people weren't the only people who are here. There's evidence of earlier woodland occupation. There are a couple different styles of pottery, and there's evidence of possible later occupations. So some of the pottery we get on the site is actually tempered with shell, which is something that's really characteristic of the Mississippian period. fossilized coral. This appears to be an old wrought iron nail. These uh, type of rust patterns, we have lines, are much more indicative of wrought iron, which is an earlier form of iron. So this piece of pottery, I notice there's a fresh break on it, and I notice there's a fresh break on this other piece of pottery. So I wonder if they fit together. Not too bad. Right next to this, I've got a little bit of a stone tool. This might be Burlington Flint. Actually, it might not be. You can see how it's actually worked. There's a lot of stuff here. So when archaeologists document a site, one of the things we use to define the boundaries of that site is an artifact scatter. That is, the artifacts, the bits of people's lives that are permanent and tangible that they dropped. So right here, I've got a little piece of prehistoric pottery. And if I go a little bit farther forward, I've got another piece of prehistoric pottery. This one's a rim. Coming in closer, we've actually got a flake of flint that someone knocked off while they were probably making an arrowhead. When plotted on the map, the location of these artifacts can show us the rough area where people were living. Now we have to factor in some skewing because there's erosion that's moving material down the edge of this site. But when we do that, we can basically get an idea of where people's like core settlement was. And just as I saw this, I saw another piece of pottery. Where? See if you can spot the prehistoric pottery that no one has touched for the last 800 years in this frame. Here's another rim sherd. Rim sherds are really useful to archaeologists because they tend to be diagnostic, which means because you know what part of the pot it is, it can help you uh, determine what type of vessel it is, and also because they oftentimes tell you about the culture that was making them. 
the very enough tribe to tribe and group to group. Here's a cool piece of heat treated shirt. You can see the reddening and oxidation of the iron within the rock that's a result of this prolonged exposure to heat. Now, this is a process that Native Americans would have used to improve their tool stone, but it also may be an accidental byproduct from the rednecks here drinking beer and having fires on the beach because we have evidence of that as well. So I just found this flake of hard stone. This is probably basalt or similar or mafic rock. Um, and this is noteworthy because you can see where flakes had been struck from it. But this isn't flint. This is for a different type of tool. This is most likely the byproduct of manufacturing axes or some other hard stone tool that would have been employed in a thing like chopping or grinding. So one of the important plants on this site is this, stinging nettle. Stinging nettle gets its name due to these little spines you see here. These are actually tiny hypodermic needles filled with formic acid. And when you touch them with your skin, it injects that acid and gives you a painful stinging sensation. Despite this, it's actually edible. The leaves can be rolled up and eaten, and it can actually be boiled and made into a tea. One of the reasons why this plant was useful to prehistoric people is it's very fibrous, and these fibers are fairly strong. So when this plant is cut, the stem, you know, you must take and break it apart, but you can extract fibers from it that can be turned into cordage. And one of the reasons why this relates to pottery is a lot of pottery during the woodland period is cord marked. These cords would have been wrapped around a paddle or stick and then impressed into the pottery, giving it texture and a bit more surface area. So as we were coming up to gather the clay, we actually found another archeological site. Um, this has pottery in it and it's a different type of pottery. This is shell tempered pottery. And you can see these small bits are actually bits of mussel shell from the river. You can also see there's some nice designs on them. And this mussel shell was added in order to make the pot more resistant to thermal shock. One of the things about the shell tempering is that it's very intentional to make it resistant to thermal shock, but it's not as good at making the pottery resistant to mechanical uh, damage.